Hello, uh, my name is Jim Partridge. I am a uh, modder. I make maps and mods for Half-Life 2. Um, and I will be talking you through my favourite level of Half-Life 2 Episode 2. It's pretty much my favourite level of all the Half-Life games. Um, but I will be talking through it from a gameplay perspective. We're not going to really talk about aesthetics too much. We're not going to talk about map uh, or, or you know detailing or anything like that. I am interested purely in this uh, in gameplay and analysing Half-Life 2 from a gameplay perspective and uh, uncovering the reason why I think Half-Life 2 is still so very very popular and why people still build mods for it and why people still continue to try and recreate the magic that uh, Valve created with Half-Life 2 and why Half-Life 2 is considered to be pretty much the best first person shooter ever. <laughs> Never noticed him before, look at that. See. There's another reason. Right, so here we are at my favourite map of all time. This is a key moment in this map. Uh, first of all, I've already let the story bit play through, but what Alex did, she basically pointed out the fact that the car is on the far side of the bridge over here. Um, she points it out and explains that she, we have to try and jump it back to this side of the bridge from that side. Um, Additionally, they kind of stand around this area as well, and what it does is it allows the player to view the entire map uh, layout. So here we can pretty much see the whole layout of the map. We don't know what it means, we don't know what it's for yet, but what we do know is that um, uh, the layout that we're looking for, that we've got the far side of the bridge over there, we've got some water, we see these pipes, um, we see this high part here, these stairs, there's key kind of um, indicators for us to, or landmarks for us to, to be able to orientate ourselves through the map. So the first thing they do is they lay out, and it's literally like looking at a map. Um, until you go to these places, you don't know what's there, but you can see the map overall. So you always have a general idea as to where you are throughout the game, or throughout the level, uh, which is why it's very, very clever. And although I did say I wasn't going to talk about aesthetics, there is one point to make about the aesthetics of this map. Uh, if you look at it, You'll notice how some of the design is quite similar to Team Fortress 2 design as well, uh, with these kind of shacks and the uh, chimneys and, and the, the sort of shapes and angles and the colours. Um, Half-Life 2, as much as many people might want to think it is, or try and design maps to be, Half-Life 2 is not realistic. It is not real to the world. It is cartoony in fact it is almost cartoony uh, it's a kind of a blend of real and cartoon uh, kind of style um, and for example people talk about lights and this kind of thing oh that's that light down there doesn't have any cables coming out of it well tough who cares you know um, it's not about that it's about getting a vibe a feel um, and Half-Life 2 has a definite feel to it okay but as I said, this map isn't about aesthetics, so we've already been told to head in here, and uh, we're on our way. Um, moving through, um, we reach an apparent dead end. We get the sound of a fast zombie, um, letting us know that there's grave things ahead. Um, there's, oh, this is a zombie area, and that is interesting because the zombies aren't really very dangerous um, by themselves. There is not really anything uh, within the zombie arsenal that can really kill us too much. Um, the black zombies we'll talk about in a little while, the black hair crab zombies, uh, can be quite dangerous, but aside from that, most of the zombies, you're going to be okay. Um, I like the zombie areas because of that. The player's never really in too much danger, but you can create a, a feel to the whole thing, um, which creates a lot of emotion, which I like about certain level design. Now, this area highlights one thing I'm going to talk about again and again here, which is that each of the individual areas, uh, every room you move into, every area you move into, is a game unto itself in Half-Life 2. Um, it is a specific piece of gameplay that has been designed uh, to make you think about what you're doing. This particular area of gameplay, I, each area of gameplay we come into, I'm going to be able to describe in a single sentence. This gameplay area is find the way out. It's very simple. Um, we use the grav gun to find the way out. Uh, they have placed, well first of all they hid it so we had to go and find it, and secondly they've blocked it, 
Now, you'll find that they block a lot of these areas all the way through Half-Life 2. Um, it allows us to use the grav gun, or we could have used the crowbar to break those uh, to move forward. But, what has it really added? I mean, we're heading this way, we've got to head this way, that's how the map is designed, right? So what's the diff? Um, why bother putting these wooden blocks over this area? Secondly, we move into this area, we see the same thing again. Some wooden blocks, uh, some wooden boards across the uh, the way out. Why bother? There's several reasons. One, it slows the player down a little. Um, you could quite easily race through these maps quickly if none of these obstructions were in the way. Two, um, it creates something for the player to do. And this is the really key point of all Half-Life maps. They are purely designed around the player constantly having to do something. Um, and this is no different. Uh, every single area I move into, there will be something for me to do, whether it's fight a bad guy, move some physics props, whatever. It's all, um, it's all here for you to to do. So, check this out. Drop down into this area. <gasps> ah, the way out was behind the thing I dropped down onto. One, two. I looked around. The natural thing for a player to do is to look around for the way forward. We look around here, there is no way forward, so we have to double back and find ourselves here. It's boom, 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 and then look here. What it does is basically creates a situation where you have to stop and think. Even if it's just for a moment to turn around and look at the way you came, uh, it is a st chance for the player to pause and think about what they're doing. And every single area in Half-Life 2 is designed to make the player stop and think about what they're doing, or at least consider what they're doing. None of it is straight forward. Nothing is easy. Poor chat. Don't let this bad boy out. <laughs> Not doing very well. Um, we'll talk about black head crabs in a minute. As soon as I dispatch this guy. Okay. Black head crabs, um, the head crabs themselves, are very, very useful because they cannot kill the player. They are icky, we don't like them, they cause us to panic, we run around like crazy trying to avoid them, but they can't kill you. They will reduce you down to one health. Um, if you combine black head crabs with normal head crabs, then you've got yourself a dangerous situation because they can both leap at you. This thing can get you down to one health, the other one can finish you off, basically. Uh, obviously in this situation the actual head crab guy, uh, the zombie, can actually swipe you and kill you if you let him get close and they've reduced you down to one health. But uh, using these guys to leap out at the player at various points is a great way to give the player a scare without actually possibly killing them. Um, if they, for example, were down to one health anyway, which is perfectly possible at any point in any map, and you put in a normal head crab that leaps out on them, it can cause them damage. Um, this is a key point of gameplay design. The player should only be damaged when they had the opportunity to know um, to avoid the damage. Basically, you gave them forewarning. This is dangerous. Don't be very careful. Uh, if they are not careful, they will die. If you damage the player without giving them fair warning that there is possibility of damage, then you are cheating. You are basically cheating the player out of the opportunity of... Um, of winning the game, or at least doing well. Um, the player must be able to learn how to avoid all damage at all times. Is that unusual? Yes. Crates do not break when you drop on them in Half-Life 2 in the editor. If you put a room with a crate in it and you jump on top of it, it will not break. They added a trigger on top of it that made it break when I fell, fell down onto it. Um, for no other reason than it makes this area more interesting. It serves no purpose, but it makes the area more interesting. Okay, um, why put all these crates here when they serve no purpose? There isn't even any goodies about over here, there's nothing to pick up, there's nothing to do. Um, because it encourages the player to rummage around, have a look, and see what, if there's anything that's going on. The player gets very used to exploring and looking around and making sure to see if there's any goodies to be had. Um, by putting areas like this, it basically keeps the player interested, it keeps the player thinking all the time. Once again, exactly the same thing here, that could have just simply been left like this, but they didn't, they put that in the way. Also, this gives you a bit of a weapon against the, these guys. Okay, 
Um, kind of a forewarning. This is interesting in level design in the fact that um, you can see where you're going to head to and you can see that you have got some barnacles coming up. Um, it is, it's giving the ability to the player to have some foresight um, and they are then able to plan a little ahead or at least get themselves prepared. Um, and also what we're doing here is we're looping. We were up there, we've now dropped and we can see this and what we will do is we will loop again and we will come out and we will come out at the bottom underneath here. Um, it's a very clever use of space as well. Essentially we're just going down in a circle. Okay. So what has just happened there is a gameplay teaching tool. Uh, we walked out, uh, the zombie started to rise, but before it even got a chance to get off its knees, Alex nailed it with the sniper rifle. Um, they have just taught us that Alex is now on the sniper rifle and is available to kill bad guys if we let her. So if we see the beam, we know that it will probably take care of some bad guys for us. Um, the interesting thing about this is that if I zoom in up there, you'll notice that it's completely black and you cannot see. All that is is a combined sniper uh, entity um, set to be friendly to me through an AI relationship element um, uh, entity. So we also get another chance to look at the level at this point and actually just get our bearings. Okay, so we're in that stairwell that we saw before. Once again, we know where we are in the world. We were up there. We're now down here. It's about orientation. Okay, so now we look through again and we can see that we're at a lower point where, from where we were. Once again, we touch the world again, we touch this area again, and we are given an idea as to where we are. We hear the scream of the fast zombie again, warning us that they're coming. Okay, so speaking of mini games, here's one. Get the supplies back without losing them. Uh, the barnacle has them. If we kill the barnacle, watch what happens. The other one's got it now. Gone. Lost it. Um, if I had learned to wait, the barnacles would have dropped it and I could have grabbed it out of the air. As Because I attacked them, um, I lost them. It's a minigame. Um, and it... is rather fun. The whole point of these areas and things like this, it's completely irrelevant. There's absolutely no reason to have it here. Uh, it's not a battle. There's no. I don't have to move through this area at all. It's simply a mini game at the side of the level. And this is what makes Half-Life 2 very, very special. By combining different entities, like the barnacles and the supply crates um, and a long drop, they have created a mini game. It's not a particularly complicated mini game. All you had to do was get the uh, supplies back. But it was fun, and it gave me two seconds, and it's what makes Half-Life 2 special. Um, other games do not bother with this kind of thing. Uh, I haven't played a game in quite a while that bothered to put in an extra side bit of gameplay for no reason at all. Here's another one. It's an obstruction, but it's also a mini game. I get to play uh, with a mechanic that we learned a long, long time ago back at Half-Life 2. Uh, once again, boards in the way, no reason at all for that. Um, aesthetic point, just here's a story unto itself. Uh, the area's being shelled, the light beams tell us exactly the trajectory of the uh, shell itself as it came through the wall. Another mini game. It's almost as if the, uh, the barnacles are stealing the floor away from you uh, to prevent you from moving forward. So now you've got to find a way through. We could just jump it or we could take the side beams at the side. Um, this is another key point of Half-Life 2, which is that they give the player options. Um, and those options are everywhere can engage a situation in a variety of different ways because of the tools that you have that they're giving you to play with. Burn my okay. Um, here's a little mini game. 
This is great fun. Uh, it's, this is purely to be sadistic. Um, it says there is absolutely no reason for it at all other than to be sadistic. Uh, being sadistic is fun. Players like to be sadistic, uh, especially to zombies. Now, given that they've just given us this tool, it's here, ready to use. We've got one canister left over. Uh, they've now presented us with another very clever bit of gameplay. Here is a situation um, that I am fully in control of. The, the zombine is not interested in me, he's not paying any attention, attention to me. Um, he is busy doing something else. This gives me the opportunity to plan my attack. I can sit here and I can think, right, okay, how am I going to take care of this guy? In this case, I'm going to use a grenade. Um, perfect. I planned my attack, I executed my attack. I feel very good about myself, about the fact that I've done that. Um, there are nowhere near enough mods that allow me to do this. I don't see this in mods at all, and I don't know why. It's a very, very simple, effective thing to do. So imagine you're walking across a walkway, and there is a combine soldier walking underneath you who has not seen you. Uh, the player is completely in control of the situation, and they can assault and plan as they wish to. I could have lured him up here, and I could have lured him into the trap that they'd given me to use previously. I could have done it in a variety of different ways. Um, but the point is, is that I was given that choice. Okay, in here, uh, this is another bit of gameplay. If I enter here, the lights will go out and the zombies will wake up. Um, bit of gameplay is basically get uh, the goodies without getting dead. Hmm. Uh, once again, it's given us even more zombies to continue using with the trap, if we enjoyed using the trap. But it's giving us the opportunity to do whatever we want. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, nice little aside, a little bit of character for the fast zombie here. It even gives us some grenades, um, because they want to demonstrate this functionality. Haha, <laughs> wonderful. Throws it back out at you again. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, very clever. Okay. Uh, padlock on gate. Absolutely no reason for it whatsoever. Just gives you something else to do. Slows the player down a little bit. There you are. Yep, here I am. Okay. Um... Take care of them. Um, okay. Uh, come on, Alex, make an effort. Okay. Uh, quickly, even though this isn't about aesthetics, I'm just going to talk about map design briefly. Uh, people say to me that, oh, you have to have huge amounts of detail and you have to spend forever and oh, far too much are complicated. They're not. Look at this. That is a single brush of um, of a set size each side. Boom, boom. Uh, same, that's the same width as this height. That is the same width as that. Um, this is very blocky, this area. Um, but you, it's sold. It's sold completely to us because all of this area is made up of the same similar size of blocks. Uh, these beams, for example, one, two, three. That's three brushes and yet you're it sells, and you're just like, yep, okay, fine, no problem at all. I accept that as being uh, a reality. Um, okay, this section here is, once again, another bit of gameplay. They give us another trap. Um, this is a good point to talk about fences. Fences are fantastic things for gameplay purposes. Um, I can shoot through it. I can see through it. I can hear through it. But I can't move through it, and that's really important um, because it allows me to keep a very open feel to my world. Um, but I also am guiding the player in a very definite way. Uh, I use fences a lot in my maps, and it is uh, it's very useful and very handy. And it, instead of this corridor feeling of being constantly constricted, you can open the world up a bit and, uh, and make them feel that it's not quite so claustrophobic. Now, 
once again I, I had options there that zombie would have fired that at me which would have been caught by these guys and I could have shot it and moved to the side at that point I chose not to I chose to shoot it early and to get rid of most of them in one fell swoop um, I could have simply shot my way through these and then shot the zombies and left the barrels alone the player is always being given options Okay. here's the thing the pickup hidden behind the pipe um, you can't really see it if I was an eager player and just moved my way through then I, uh, I wouldn't be getting that I took my time I looked over here I made the effort to look over here and it really does take actual effort to look over here uh, because it's out of the way and I got rewarded for making the effort of looking um, exploration should always be rewarded and this could have quite easily not been here they could have let this wall continue straight the way across to here but instead they put a recess in chuck three pipes in and put a goodie behind it and a light and suddenly we've got this extra very minor aside of gameplay but it all adds all of these tiny pieces add up to creating the feel of a much bigger world and a much more fulfilling gameplay experience and that's exactly what a Half-Life 2 map is about if you can recess things and put extra bits of gameplay like for example here you could have quite easily put I don't know like a fence and then something behind it for the player to lift out and pick up that's what gives it the Half-Life 2 feel and once again we've got another bonus here. Uh, this is the wrong way, it's not the way to go, but if we head down and we do a bit of exploring we find some more goodies. Um, here's a saw blade, have a saw blade. Um, they are delivering the saw blade in an interesting way however. Um, they could have just put the saw blade on the floor, like that, but they didn't. They chose to put it in there. It's not a hugely complex way of of setting up in your map that would have taken you probably about two seconds well a minute or two to to sort out but it certainly adds to uh, the overall gameplay so now our gameplay has changed once again um, the gameplay has moved on to a new uh, style of gameplay and this is the whole point about Half-Life 2 is it's continually changing um, Alex is about to tell us to move shot, there you go so she's basically telling us to move these things out of the way so she can get a shot um, and she can then take care of the bad guys. So rather than the gameplay being one of a um, you know sort of aggressive kill everything, which is fine, um, but can get quite monotonous and dull, Valve have found a new way for us to engage with the bad guys. Essentially, we'll let Alex do it. Um, let the women take care of it because women are smart and beautiful and know more than we do. Um, 35 you'll learn this in time about women that is um okay so um we have a choice when do we want to drop into this area because a, a knowing half-life player knows that once we drop in here something's going to happen so uh, they completely leave it up to us there we go and the minute we drop in the action begins this next section the gameplay changes once again this guy starts hacking away at this uh this this thing that i love there we go and we are dropped into the pit so to speak um the gameplay is now move the zombies to a position where alex can kill them uh, but we're given some of our own toys too there we go um everybody likes the sword blades and zombies you can't go wrong oh, okay there we go um and so the gameplay rule has changed once again. Um, the other thing to note about this area um, is that uh, the timing of, of when things happen here is completely on Valve's uh, stopwatch. We have no control over when these panels are going to drop and when these uh, these air these new bad guys are going to get introduced to the area. Um, so, each, as I say, each of these different doorways drops at a specific time and the bad guys are introduced to the area in a very specific, um, specific manner. Mm. 
<laughs> okay. Um. Um, there's also an emotional thing going on here, though. basically that feel of constantly being approached and constantly being, being being closed in as they close in. It's a very classic zombie um, uh, motif uh, of the, the gathering crowd as they, they sort of swamp you and take you over. Smother you, so to speak. Okay. Um, okay, and then we're moving into a puzzle area. Um, puzzle areas are great because they give the chance for the player to have a breather uh, to take I mean that was quite a stressful situation I've just been in and now for the most part this is going to be reasonably straightforward um, you'll notice that the nature of the bad guys change immediately here we have barnacles which are completely passive um, and we have a couple of crawling zombies not exactly threatening stuff and the reason for that is because it's a puzzle area. And puzzle areas um, should not be stressful. Uh, the player needs time to think. The player needs time to consider the puzzle and to work out what it is they've got to do. Um, a bad puzzle area is an area that is filled with bad guys. Oh, where did you go? Uh, the, uh, a bad puzzle area is a puzzle area that is filled with bad guys um, that have uh, oh that are stressful bad guys that will uh, chase you around and, and make you panic um, your puzzle area should never have these kind of bad guys in it uh, very very small non-threatening bad guys should be there or at least something that isn't a danger to life and them. Okay, let's talk about puzzles. Um, I love designing puzzles, and there is a very, very straightforward process to designing puzzles, and it's amazing to me how many people get this wrong. Um, you show the player the objective. This is where you need, are aiming to get to, and then you let them work out the bit in the middle. It's that simple. And that bit in the middle has to be pretty darn obvious, I hate to say it, uh, unfortunately, players don't really think too clearly about uh, what they need to do, or at least puzzles just shouldn't be that complex. Here, it's very straightforward. Look, there's where the, I'm heading to, and there's a forklift truck in between. Forklift truck, it's great big yellow thing, so it's easy to spot. And secondly, um, I think everyone's fairly familiar with what a forklift truck does. So, uh, we head down, hit the bright red handle. And up it goes. Pretty darn straightforward. Um, not stressful, but rewarding nonetheless. The player feels like they've cracked a uh, an interesting puzzle. It slowed the, the, the pace of play down a little as well. Uh, after all that hectic running around. As far as I'm concerned, you should think about your... Um, your gameplay as a, a helix, a sort of a, a, a wavelength as it's moving up and down in tempo. Um, at the moment we're at the low ebb of that tempo. That tempo will get faster as we move through this area. Okay, so once again just a moment to pause and they are bringing us back out into this area and once again we can look up and see where Alex is and get our bearings as to where we are in the situation and where we are in the map that they showed us earlier. Uh, we recognize the two pipes, so we know we're over there. Um, this is an important bit too, I'm sure you've heard about this before, but this is a, essentially a, a function of push gameplay. It is a point of no return, I cannot get now get back to the areas where I was before, and that's on purpose. Uh, Valve want me to keep moving through the area. They do not want me to constantly have to be able to run all the way back to the beginning. Uh, you'll notice that, that you get broken staircases and stuff like that uh, that do the same thing. Okay, uh, this is a um, another piece of gameplay. Um, don't step in the goo is the simple gameplay description. Um, you don't really need the pallets, it's kind of a proposal to you. Here's some pallets. You might want to use them to stop yourself getting out of the 
uh, goo. But oh, go away. As we've seen before, um, it's not absolutely necessary. Mm, this is not good. Let's get out of here. Um, we didn't have to use the pallets at all, they were put there as a proposal to the player, as I said. There is, uh, there are quite a lot of elements like this in Half-Life 2, and this is really important. Once again, you're not forcing the player to do anything, you are simply just saying, hey, why not do this? Um, this next area that I'm in right now is quite interesting, because it's one of the only areas where you have an infinite, uh, bit of gameplay. We see the beer bottles, we see the, uh, and there's a bit of storytelling here. Chair, beer, gun, grenades. Someone has sat here having a wonderful time for quite a while. Um, taking care of zombies. And these guys will continually spawn, and I've added a few areas like this in some of my maps uh, before. Um, and uh, I think people like it. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I've done this quite a lot, maybe too much in some of my maps, which is um, hide the goodies behind the fence, making them lift them over. It's once again just something else to do. Um, they could have made this section very clearly just a walk through, but instead you crouch. Why do you crouch? Because it gives you something else to do. It is not a straightforward way forward. Uh, is it's not a straightforward method to moving forward. This constant, constant engaging the player in something else to do is is the fundamental basis of Half-Life map. Okay, once again, point of no return. Can't go back. Why can't we go back? Well, otherwise we would be able to get endless amounts of grenades. Uh, this is interesting because in the area we're coming up to in the river, um, the spools will be used more and more. This leap, this, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, stepping stone, uh, spool, just hints at that kind of gameplay and says, don't forget, you can use these to stop yourself from going in the water, remember this. So when you played Half-Life 2, you, can pro you will remember uh, this from the um, radioactive tunnel where we, we use the spools as stepping stones. Um, once again, uh, they're just reminding us of that gameplay, or teaching new people, if they haven't played that before. This I really like. This is, once again, using a couple of simple elements to create a new bit of gameplay. It's completely inconsequential to the rest of the map, but here we have a box. Uh, now, we know full well that if we broke this here, any small items would go through that gap, and we'd lose them in the gunge. So the player has to think, has to stop and think once again. Constantly, constantly thinking, forcing the player to think and reconsider what they're doing. There we go. And I could, if I needed it, I could have picked that up there and I wouldn't have lost anything. But I had to stop and think about it. Okay, and here we are at the, uh, at the area where we have to use the spools. We don't have to, once again. I could quite easily jump from here to there and um, not step in the goo. Um, I like this area because you can use these, uh, these spools in several different ways. They're quite good as a weapon with the grav gun as well and to kill all of these zombies that come up. And the island are quite clever because they're... Um, it, just adds a lot more pressure to the player. There's 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 less places to go. So you've got the island uh, function. The island's function is a way of uh, putting you in close quarters with the, um, the zombine. 
um, making you panic all the more. Once again, it's about emotion. It's about getting that panicky emotion going on. Um, now, as we move up, we can hear Alex congratulate us for getting over. That is the point of Alex, by the way. Alex is there to congratulate you and just give you a hint along the way, but mainly to congratulate you, actually. Okay, this area here, uh, this lovely hut, which I quite like the detailing on, and um, the, uh, the, the hut next door are completely and totally pointless. Those, other than to provide the player with a few pickups and just to refresh uh, them, there's no reason for having them. So why bother? Because once again, it gives the player something else to do, and it fleshes out the world a bit more and makes the map a bit full. And they probably would have thought, right, we get to the far bank, and you just head up here. Well, that's kind of boring. We'll just add this here. So I think that's a good lesson to learn: is that every single time you have an area which seems incredibly straightforward, add one other element to it that is completely unnecessary um, that the player that the player can just do a little bit more exploring and pick up a bonus of some kind whether it's a recess or a dead end little crawly space that they can go into to pick up a bonus or whatever okay and then we get to the final um, main puzzle of the area but Once again, I may cull it here because I think we've all played this bit and we all know what happens. You move the car to this end, it's a seesaw bridge, and um, you jump the car across and then you complete the map. Um, we are... the entire map is one big puzzle. That's the point. Um, the entire map is a, uh, a puzzle from start to finish. constantly reminded of where you are within that puzzle um, and how you're progressing. You are reminded of your progress every turn um, and um, it's it's incredibly efficient and very very well done and it provides a, a hell of a lot of solid Half-Life 2 style gameplay um, uh, in what is really actually quite a small space. But what we've done, we've just snaked our way all the way through this area. We've come all the way around various different ways, and they've just really reamed as much gameplay out of this area as possible. Um, this is efficient level design at its best, in my opinion. So there you go. I'm not going to jump the bridge because uh, I've got other stuff to do. I've got levels to go and build. Um, but I hope that was useful. I hope that was helpful. I hope you enjoyed listening to me. I know I go on a bit. Um, and if you've got any questions, please add them to the bottom of the uh, the video. Or if you want to get in touch, then uh, I'll put my details there and you can ask me any questions as you go. But I hope this was useful and uh, take care.